here at NAB. We have our last presentation of today with uh, Bobo Petrov. Petrov. And he's going to be going through Krakatoa for Cinema 4D. And this is one of three presentations. Yes, it yes. will be uh, every day throughout the show, uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday at 530. So definitely make sure you stop back again tomorrow. And if you can't make it, you can go to c4dlive.com and watch live streaming of all of our presentations. Or you can watch them later at your leisure. Also, make sure that you register when you're there because you'll be entered in our raffle to win one of many fabulous prizes from our sponsors. So let's give Bobo a big round of applause. Thank you. So, Krikator for Cinema 4D. What is Krikator and why should it be in Cinema 4D? Uh, it turns out it's very logical uh, to integrate that product with uh, Maxon's 3D application. Um, Krikator is a volumetric particle rendering, manipulation, and management toolkit which uh, was developed during visual effects production uh, since around 2004, 2005, and so was initially available for 3ds Max and then for Maya and a standalone renderer. And now, finally, next Monday, we're actually shipping it for Cinema 4D, integrated fully. And today I'm going to show you the basics and in the next two days, the more advanced uh, workflows and things that you can do with it and you'll uh, hopefully understand why it's a good idea. Um, all those uh, versions that I mentioned share the same code and the same data format so you can actually integrate Cinema 4D in an existing pipeline with Crypto Artists and they will know exactly what they're doing because the workflows are very similar and the uh, um, render engine under the hood is the same. Lots of... Uh, visual effects have been done with it and a lot of commercials, which is uh, one of the reasons why it makes so much sense in Cinema 4D. Um, these are some of the uh, more important uh, points in the history of Krakatoa, like Superman Returns, uh, G.I. Joe, Avatar, Harry Potter, and so on. But, and The Avengers, one of my favorite uh, openings ever. I'm going to actually go and uh, play back quickly Oops. Um, go to the finder, and this is quickly uh, a couple of shots which Hydraulics worked on. And um, you can now, using mostly, oops, sorry, using mostly um, thinking particles, X particles, uh, uh, turbulence FD, uh, even the built-in emitter from the old days of Cinema 4D you can actually uh, create similar or the same effects pretty much. Especially with X-Particles, you can push the particle count very far and the logic and the design of the effects really to the maximum. And Crypto will let you render that really fast. Um, another thing that I usually like showing quickly is this spot, which was done uh, by a German company a couple of years ago, which was actually they were learning Crypto while doing this project. It's for the Chinese television. And it's an award-winning spot, which inspired a lot of people to actually do ink in water effects. If you open YouTube, it's 90% of the examples of people trying to use Krikator. First thing they do is they drop a, some paint in water and try to create that look. And uh, I find it amazing, and that's my go-to example usually to uh, show what Krikator could be used for. But there are so many other things that could be done with it. I'm going to go now into some more details how it works under the hood and uh, what you can do with it and how to use it with the various systems uh, of uh, Cinema 4D. So let's, uh, let's close this and just go to our uh, application and I'll open from uh, my day one presentation one example. If you were uh, around or watched the presentation of Casey uh, last year at SIGGRAPH, he asked a uh, rhetorical question. Why is everybody using the Buddha? It's, it's a fact that there is a, a repository of very nicely scanned and very old meshes at Stanford University. And lots of people are using them to test their tools when they are doing visual effects uh, development and so on. So the Buddha is actually one of those objects that are very useful for testing volumetric rendering, for example, or any surface effects, because it's so complex as a surface and has so many, 
intricate details. What I'm going to show you right now is one of the features of uh, Krakatoa. If you want to locate Krakatoa, there are two major places where you'll find it. It's obviously the render dialog. You can go into uh, the Krakatoa, select it, and you've got a couple of tabs, including the licensing, which you use in the very beginning to actually get it running. And after that, there is uh, logging tools and shaders and options and output, and I'll explain a little bit more about them as I go. But the other thing that we have is on the plugins, we have a Krakatoa sub menu, and in it, uh, we have a bunch of uh, objects that we ship with the product. Some of them are Krakatoa specific, and some of them are connections to Cinema 4D objects like uh, emitters, TP, uh, X particles, uh, and Turbulence FD. I'm going to dock this one up there, so I have all those objects all the time. And the first thing that I want to test, and the reason I'm using it is because it's the easiest way to create a million particles in no time. I have this Buddha statue, and I'm going to click on the Krakatoa PT volume. It creates a new object, and the other interesting thing that happens in this case is you'll notice that the object is already populated with the mesh that I had selected. You could go the other way if I would delete this object, and I don't have the Buddha selected and create a PRT volume. I'll create the PRT volume and then I have to get the Buddha and drag it into the object and that's one click too many. So in general, we try to get the workflow to always be, I have my mesh, I don't have this object. I select the mesh, I create the object from it and it's already connected and ready to go. If I hide this in the viewport, you'll see that we already have some point cloud there. And the viewport is using a very large value and is calculated on the fly. When you pick a new mesh, it recalculates to give you a non-problematic uh, number of particles so I can work with, but I can start reducing it interactively. And what you see right now is the mesh is being resampled to a level set and each voxel has been filled with one or more particles. Right now, only one. And I can uh, start adding subdivisions to that. If I slide the slider, the subdivisions will apply to rendering, but not to the viewport. I have to check this checkbox that says, also show me the subdivisions in the viewport. And when I do that, it's getting really solid. So uh, I won't do this, but the other useful thing is, you'll probably notice that I have a grid which is very regular, X, Y, and Z, uh, rows of rows of particles. So I'll check the jittered mode, and now it's kind of diffuse. And I have the one iteration here, so it will subdivide each voxel, and if the particles happens to be inside the volume still, it will use it. The other thing that I need is a light. If I don't have a light, I can render additively, but I can't really do volumetric shading. So I create a default light. I'll switch it to be a, a, a different type. I'll make it a parallel spot, and I'll go to the detail, uh, detail settings, make it a little bit bigger, and probably even give it some hotspot there. So at this point, we have an object that can render in Krakatoa. We have Krakatoa assigned as the renderer. And I'm going to hit the render button and see what I'm going to get. The other thing, the, the third thing that you probably need in this case is open the console and read the output. Right now, we have created 5.7 million particles in 0 0.8 seconds. Then we sorted them, lit them, and sorted them again and rendered them uh, from the camera in 4.3 seconds altogether. Uh, the laptop over there actually did that in three and a half seconds, so I don't know. Uh, but it's, it's CPU-based, and it's uh, multi-threaded and relatively fast. And at this point, we have those almost six million particles, and it, it looks nice. There is a sh the shadow there, and uh, I, if I zoom in, you'll see that it's made of points, so it's, it's kind of slightly spongy in some cases, but you can tweak those settings nicely. I'll go to the render dialog and explain a couple of the important controls here. The really major area that you're going to use is the so-called final pass density. And the final pass density, basically, each particle that comes, unless it has a specific value that was already assigned by the source, which in the case of PAT volume is the case, each particle has a specific value based on where it was in the volume and how big the volume was, Sometimes, if you have X particles, for example, each particle comes and says, I have density of one. And that means if you put 100 particles somewhere and render them, or one particle with a density of 100, the result visually will be the same. Each contributes to the space where it lands a certain amount of density. So uh, when you have a scene, and the scene has a certain scale, and you have created your particles, you might want to tweak that density for globally for the whole scene. I can do it per object, but in this case, I see that I have a value of 5 and an exponent of minus 1, which means 5 times 10 to the power of minus 1, or 0 
If I wanted to, to be 0 0.05, all I have to do is get that one, one number down. Minus two means two decimal uh, positions after the uh, decimal point. And at this point, if I render, you'll notice that my statue will become more transparent for the camera and will become also more transparent for the light and the shadow won't be that deep. And the lighting is uh, scattering within the volume. But what if you have a customer and the customer says, OK, I'm looking at the alpha and this is kind of uh, too transparent. I don't like this result. I want to be very solid. So we go back with our setting to minus one, but we want the light to still think that the object is more transparent than the camera sees it. So we can override this. It's not physically correct, but your director is never physically correct. So um, in this case, I can go and say I have two orders of magnitude for the light, but for the camera, I'll still keep the odd one. If I render now, nothing will change for the alpha. But once it's rendered, my shadows are, are still the less intense than in the beginning. And my uh, actual density of the particles is higher than, than it, it's like it was in the beginning. So I'm passing more light through while the camera is keeping it real. And at this point, we are shining white light on white particles. What if we wanted to start uh, attenuating that light? As it's passing through each particle, it loses a little bit of, light, of uh, energy and it also gets uh, diffused into the eye. Right now we're using a shader that is isotropic, that means from any angle you're going to see the same amount of light bouncing into it. Um, I can switch this one to a funk shader, and if I render now, it will actually look more like, uh, we have specular highlights and look more like a metal object. But, here you go. But the other thing that um, uh, we wanted to talk about in this case let me go back here, is the so-called uh, absorption. So right now, the absorption, if I enable it and leave it at black, nothing will change. All the three channels, R, G, and B, will be affected at the same time, and you'll get the gray shadow. But if I go and increase the red component without touching the green and blue, or let's say I'll touch a little bit the green, a lot of the red, and I'm not touching the blue at all. So if I enable also the option that says use absorption and hit render, Remember, I already switched back to isotropic, so it will be back as it was before. You start getting a bluish tint because just like in the water, certain wavelengths are being absorbed differently. So the red is going away faster than the green, and the blue is not even changing at all. That's why if you dive from the water, everything starts getting bluish because the red uh, wavelengths are actually being eaten by the water much faster. And in this case, we're simulating a similar effect inside the volume. The light is passing through those particles and losing more of one component than the others. Um, I can do a couple of things to get this uh, work with your compositing because Krakato is a dedicated renderer and as you can see, you select it and it renders only particles and nothing else. It can kind of render meshes, but it renders them only for uh, occlusion, let's say, matte objects or hold, holdouts as they're known. If I would go and create a default sphere somewhere here, and it's occluding some of the particles, some are inside and some are behind it and some are in front of it. It would be kind of tricky, but I'm going to show you how you would use this in order to actually get good results that can work in After Effects, for example, or in Nuke. Uh, this sphere needs a tag. We have a bunch of tags. This is actually the third place where you're going to look for Krakatoa stuff. There is the Krakatoa tags. And I have a couple of channel-related things and we have a Krakatoa camera and a Krakatoa mesh. I'll add this Krakatoa mesh. And if we take a look at this, um, it has two checkboxes. The one says um, visible to camera and visible to lights. That means it's going to cast shadows potentially onto the particles that are behind it. And it's going to occlude the particles that we're rendering so we get a hole. But when I'm rendering in the output, I'm going to say that I want to also render occluded particles pass and actually enable also the normal so I can see it. Um, if I would render now, um, this object is going to occlude particles, but it actually won't cast shadows because I also have to enable explicitly shadow casting in the spot, in the light. But you see that I actually have now the sphere here. If I go on to the layers, you see I have my uh, normal pass, but I also have one that's called occluded. And these are all the particles within the sphere inside. And now if you have a semi-transparent sphere, you can put it, you can put this pass that you're currently seeing in the background, then 
composite on top the rendering from your uh, Cinema 4D rendering of the geometry that's semi-transparent or anti-aliased. And then on top of that, composite the front, which is this image. And then the result will be uh, your particles interacting with a volume that is semi-occluding them. We Unfortunately, currently, we cannot do that with multiple layers. If you have particle geometry, particle geometry, and semi-transparent objects in between will be kind of tricky, but you can probably render the particles in multiple passes and then composite them as you need them. And in some cases, you can use uh, other particle objects to catch shadows or do other th uh, things that you need because you can turn a solid object, as you see, very easily into a particle cloud that works in Krakatoa. Now let's talk about the shadow casting. Uh, this sphere here, as I mentioned, if I would render now, and actually it's a, it's a pretty big object, I'll make it a little bit smaller. Um, so... Uh, Let's see, right now it's 100, I'll, I'll make it sl smaller, and as I mentioned, in the light, I have to make sure that in the general settings, I have switched to shadows. Now, you notice that shadows were cast on by particles onto particles no matter what, and that's something that we cannot even turn off, it's part of Krakatoa. Krakatoa renders particles volumetrically by attenuating light, and the shadows come as a side effect. So even if you don't enable shadows, your lights will still cast shadows from particles onto particles. But when you want this mesh, to actually cast a shadow onto the particles, you need to enable some, any of the not none options here. And no matter which one you pick, we're still going to use the same algorithm internally, so it's better to pick the soft shadows, because then we can change shadow map sizes and they will affect the rendering and so on. Let's see if that actually works. I'm not sure if I put it in the right place there. Hopefully I did. Um, rendering, no, it didn't, so let me see where it is, really. Interesting, it, it kind of looks like it's there, I might have done something wrong, but let's see. Appa, that was me using an apple, uh, used uh, the wrong keyboard shortcut for rotation, so uh, you have to bear with me, but I haven't really used uh, an apple computer since the 90s. So uh, today's kind of my, my first. Um, and you know, I'm going to also create a default camera so I have it to remember wh what I was d uh, doing here. Um, it looks like this is a little bit off and that's why it's not exactly casting a shadow there. Uh, no, I really don't need the second one. So um, let's switch back to that camera. Did I do the right thing? Looks like I didn't. Anyway. Um, at this point, let's see if I'll get the shadow, and if I don't get the shadow, then I'll, I'll just go on and figure out what's going on. Come on, cast the shadow. Okay, that's a pretty solid shadow, actually, because there is no other ambient light around bouncing. You can fake that by actually going into the render settings and uh, use the emission channel to actually produce additional light that's coming from nowhere. It's just there. Um, and that's really easy. You can say, okay, I want to use emission. And the uh, emission can be overwritten for the whole scene to the same value, but for all these channels, you can actually go to, the, uh, to any of the source objects, and they have in the setup, they have a couple of checkboxes where I can overwrite for just for this object its settings. So I can go here and say it has an emission, and that emission will be something bluish and not too strong. Uh, it probably be, will be very strong when I first render it, but let's see. Uh, this way, the whole thing will get an additional bluish tint, and the shadow area will be kind of solid blue. Now you get it. Of course, I could create a secondary light somewhere and bounce more light there, and you would see it. You can use a uh, point light, for example, with a lower intensity and so on. But this is kind of getting there. We are seeing the, uh, the object is casting the shadow, and the shadow is in, on our mesh and so on. Uh, let's disable the shadow casting here for a second. So I'll go here and say I don't want this to be visible to cameras or lights, so it's pretty much off. But I want to change the quality of the shadow. So I'll select my light, and in the light, as I mentioned, the shadow uh, parameters that we have, 250 by 250 is currently the attenuation shadow map that we are generating internally. We're reading that parameter and actually using it. That means if I render now as it is, without that additional... Um, shadow casting object. I have my object with, uh, with my emission that was enabled and so on. And I'm going now to change this one to a relatively high, 1,500 by 1,500. Render again. It won't make it much slower, really. Um, it will use a little bit more memory, obviously, but in general, the result is similar. And 
Um, let's make this one a buffer A and make this one buffer B and take a look at the difference and you see that the shadows are getting more pronounced. And I can go here to custom settings and really undersample it a lot. 64 by 64 is ridiculously low. And if I would render this, uh, you see that it will get very, very diffuse shadows. And the other thing that I have to mention is the density uh, spinner of the, the value of the light. See, that's now, let's make this one, channel B, and compare. Uh, and you can get really, really, really diffuse. So uh, the particles are written in such a small bitmap, more or less, that each one is covering almost 100 particles behind it or so, uh, and it's diffusing really quickly. Um, if you want the density of a single light to be, um, that means the particle density to be different and pass more light from one light source than another, you can use the density spinner. And if you set it to 50%, the shadow density uh, will be respected. That means even more light will pass through the particles and it will get even more illuminated. So if you have two light sources and you want, see that got really milky. Um, if you want to uh, have two different lights that are uh, um, affecting the object, the same object in a different way, you can go in the um, shadow settings of that light and, and pretty much do, do that. Okay, I, I stayed with the Buddha a lot. Let's uh, take a look at uh, a couple of other things. Um, I have this yet another uh, model from, uh, from the Stanford Library. And um, it's similar story. I already have a PRT volume here. And let's hit render and see what it renders. As I mentioned in the console, we can watch what it's doing. It created 6.1 uh, million particles and rendered them in five seconds. But the important here, uh, it, it doesn't really look very uh, nice right now. But uh, the reason I created this scene was to take a look at the depth of field settings. The depth of field is currently not enabled, uh, but I have already set it up, more or less. So if I render again, I would hope that this is going to defocus the snout of the dragon a lot. Yeah, it's getting there. And I have this, the middle end focus, and it's really extreme. Uh, the object is only 30 centimeters in size, and it's like a macro, like really zooming in and, and creating a... Uh, this effect. Well, basically what happens is that each particle that's been drawn on screen has been drawn multiple times within the circle of confusion that was calculated for that camera. So it's technically still drawing particles, but instead of the six million that we believe that we're drawing, or whatever the number was, is actually redrawing each particle many, many times. So technically you're rendering probably 20, 30 million at this point. Um, but the drawing is fast enough to actually give you the results that you want. So motion blood and depth of field are basically there. And uh, so far, I haven't really shown you any motion blur. But what I wanted to show you in the process is I mentioned that we have these tags. And some of those tags do very useful stuff. Uh, the first one especially, which is the channel copy. Um, we have our own channel system where each particle uh, contains certain data. And depending on the object, if it's an um, X-particle object, for example, you get in the connector um, in the X particles tab, you get some checkboxes to acquire so those channels from the system. But in the case of the PAT volume uh, that we're currently using to actually turn this dragon, which I'll hide in the viewport, um, so these particles, the green particles that we're currently seeing, uh, they actually acquire every property that they can find on the surface of the mesh that we're filling. So if you have mapping coordinates, UVs, if you have normals, they are all going to be actually acquired and become part of the particle system. So if I go to this object in this tag, and I say I want to actually copy a channel called normal, which exists because the surface has normals, and I'm going to copy it into the color channel, I start seeing my normals as colors. Not only that, you see a list of all the channels that we found in this object. You see that we have color, density, sign distance, which is how far the particle is from the surface of the object, a density gradient, which points in the direction of falling, uh, actually increasing density, uh, normal and position, they're all there. If I would go to this object and uh, start tweaking its settings, for example, to create more particles, uh, let's go here to 15 or something. Okay, gets more solid. And at the bottom in the display settings, I actually have uh, display normals. Uh, it's a little bit large in this case because the object is so small, so that they are drawn with 10 
units length, I think we should add a spinner to actually control that size. But if I would hit render, now I'm going to actually render this uh, uh, object with the color set based on the normal direction. And you can go further with that by copying certain channels in certain places where you need them. For example, if you simulate an X particle system, and you need the velocity to be visualized, you can just copy the velocity into color and see it either on screen or in the final rendering. And it can go much further and you're going to see that tomorrow and on Wednesday when I actually start using those tags a lot more because I'll need them to actually create some uh, kind of interesting things. Um, in order to give you a, a little bit of, um, let's say, taste of where we're going with all this stuff, um, let me see, I have Tomorrow we'll be covering repopulation of particles. That means taking very few particles and creating millions and millions of them procedurally at random time. Uh, we'll take a look at how to use the tags in order to control shading channels. So instead of having specular highlights that are uniform on every object in the scene for all the particles, you can do it per particle controlling with the, the channels and with textures. So you can map your object and have specular highlight power and level and so on controlled for each particle. and creating really amazing looks. Um, and uh, I'll finish with one video, uh, actually a couple of examples that were created by our beta testers during the beta, so I get an idea what people were doing with it. Um, here is uh, one test of uh, uh, Avalanche that uh, Rafael Rao in Germany did uh, in the very early phases of crypto beta testing. Just X particles, spawning more particles as they're moving down. Uh, it's kind of neat. And what's even better, the, um, the guy who actually started the whole thing from Ugly Kids, Daniel, um, this is pretty much how Krakatoa for Cinema 4D started as a project of some guys that said it's a good idea to take the standalone rendering connected to Cinema 4D. We later uh, got into an agreement and acquired the code and we developed it further, but this is where the whole... Uh, Think the whole avalanche really started from. And this is one uh, example. Actually, I have it here on day three in the logo review, and uh, I think it's a good closing uh, example because it's very Cinema 4D related. What you're seeing here, and I'm going to discuss it in detail on Wednesday, this is a real flow simulation which was simulated without those colors in real flow and then brought back into Cinema 4D, and the camera projection was added uh, to it, where the colors are actually stuck to the particles as they're moving around, and as they're being blown away, they reveal the Krakatoa logo, which was locked in place during the real flow simulation. So this is using external data, repopulating the external data to create millions of particles out of very few, and using a unique tool set that we added to Cinema 4D, and currently it's only Cinema 4D, for generating sticky channels from any data that you can get from any source outside or within Cinema 4D which allows you to create uh, effects like having a color that uh, persists taken from a camera projection but as it's moving through the projection it still acquires from the original position where the particle was born instead of moving through the color space and that lets you take a solid object and blow it into pieces which uh, I will on Wednesday but uh, I'll I will show you actually the first video ever done with Cricketer, which we uh, introduced Cricketer with back in 2006 at SIGGRAPH. And this is same principle as the uh, logo that you just saw. This is a car that actually turns into particles and slowly dissipating. And a lot of effects have been done over the years that uh, use the same approach. And we made sure that the Cinema 4D uh, implementation of Cricketer makes this thing actually even easier than it was before in the other implementations of Cricket and it's really fun to work with it. A lot of things can be done by just taking a solid object, covering with particles, with X particles or TP or whatever, and then using camera projection to uh, project, for example, rendering out of the Cinema 4D renderer, any renderer pretty much that you have access to. You Think of the particles as pixels in 3D space. So what you're doing is your camera projecting onto points that you can move freely with X particles or with thinking particles. So it actually gives you something that Nuke would probably try to do but won't be able to do with 100 million particles. In this case, you can create an object, a guy running, and suddenly he turns into dust, and each point on his body is going to follow as the particles moving around. It really looks like he's blown into smithereens. Uh, 
interesting fact is that uh, Transformers 3 had the m largest count of people killed by robots using Krakatoa. They were turning into the dust. Uh, was it? Uh, yeah, which company was it? Atomic? Atomic Fiction did that. And they sent us and said, look, robots killing people, and this is the highest particle count and the highest kill count ever of coming from Krakatoa. And it was. Um, one effect that you can now recreate with the tools that you have, and many other effects that I'm going to talk about in the next two days. Um, it looks like, according to my watch, I have two more minutes. I'll probably play that video again because there were calls from the audience to actually see the log review. I have a smaller version that is more intense in color. I just changed the settings a little bit, but it's a lower resolution, so I'll just play it. I'll play it on full screen, but it's not as high quality because it's pixelated. It's really 640 by 480 or something, or even less. But the principle is the same, and uh, the other video that you just saw before was actually given to us by Daniel. And uh, I'll play that too. It was the proof of concept that you can actually take real flow particles, bring them into Cinema 4D, remap them, repopulate them, and render them, and create something that binds the two worlds together, Krakatoa and Cinema 4D, in happy coexistence. Uh, any questions in the two minutes about the things that I talked about today, or probably f what you want to hear tomorrow? Does that resolution step guarantee that all the spaces will be filled with particles? Yes. Uh, the repopulation basically lets you... It works very similar to the way that particle volume worked, but instead of using a mesh, you take some particles, you, it puts them internally on a grid, and populates particles around each particle. It looks a little bit like a blob mesh, if you think about it. And you can increase the number of particles per voxel and the resolution of the voxel grid. So uh, after a while, you're going to, to get blobby surfaces that if two particles come together, they, they're going to merge, there is no overlap. It's not a blob here and a blob here, and when you overlap, you have double the particles. They actually merge together as, as a surface. And um, you can keep on increasing the number until you have the, the look that you want. Tomorrow, I'll take a... 80,000 particles real flow simulation and do 20 million particles with it just to show you what it looks like because it actually makes sense with fluid simulations. And we read the bin files from real flow natively and we have our own format and you can read text files that you can write with a script or Excel if you want. You can take an Excel spreadsheet, write it as comma separated value out, load it and render as particles. So I challenge you to do that. That's from me and it's exactly six. Out. <laughs> so thank you so much, Bobo. And uh, we will be back 9.30 tomorrow morning with the guys from Ghost Town Media. So be sure to come back and check that out. C40 Live is where you can watch all of these presentations live streaming and register to win. And I think we all got to move on out. So thanks, guys. We'll see you tomorrow.